Please be seated. I have a brief word for the young ones, but I won't call them forward because that was a long reading. We don't have time for all the toing and froing today. So, young ones that are out there, have you ever eaten chicken, like fried chicken? Damon, have you ever eaten no fried chicken? Have you ever eaten chicken on the bone, where you have to kind of pry it off with your teeth, right? You have you guys? Chicken? No? All right. If you're vegetarian or vegan, that's okay. I know, that's right. You're pescatarian. I forgot. Yeah, that's right. Um, but if you've ever done that, where you've eaten the meat off the bone, you're kind of left with, you're not sure what to eat sometimes. My kids don't, <laughs> don't know what to eat. Like, that's a tendon. I don't want to eat that. That's a sinew. Yuck. Um, but I was raised with a Depression-era grandmother, and she knew how to make the most out of everything. So not only would she eat all the sinew and all the cartilage and all that, she would snap the bone in half and then suck out the marrow. She, and she taught me to do that as well. Yes, Pansy agrees. That's right. In Jamaica, you got to use what you got. Probably the same thing in the Congo. We have opportunities to find abundance in our midst, if only we know where to look. In that first reading from Ezekiel, we find these very, very dry bones, and it feels like all hope is lost. And yet somehow, even then, God gives us the eyes, if we can just see and hope that the breath will come and life will come again. I don't know um, about you young ones, but I know life is sometimes scary, and it feels like we don't know what to do sometimes when we have to do something difficult, and it can feel like it's a valley full of dry bones. But even still, then, God comes and gives us the energy that we need. All you have to do is pray to God and say, God, show me the way. And that's what Ezekiel did today. So as you go about your days, I invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to come and show you the way to make things a little bit more lively lively as you go. Amen. Today, I have the privilege uh, of inviting my friend, uh, my colleague, my teacher, Ron McIntyre, Canon Ron McIntyre, to offer a word today. I couldn't think uh, of a a better day um, to think about, to invite Ron to preach than today with all of our our readings about resurrection and uh, finding hope in the midst of what seems like hopeless moments. You know it's been a tumultuous almost year at St. Luke's since Ron's Met a diagnosis, terminal diagnosis of, of brain cancer, uh, and he has been thinking a lot about life these last few weeks and months. And so uh, I thought I would uh, interview Ron. I'll stand over here on this mic, and we'll do kind of a conversational sermon this morning. So, Ron, I know that when I hired you to be Minister of Music, we talked a lot about all your various backgrounds and a long discussion of what ministry means to you. Can you briefly tell us kind of about your idea of ministry and kind of how you were raised? Sure. Uh, Wow, it's weird standing up here. I've never been this 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 high up before. Uh, uh, You notice he said briefly. That was very intentional. Uh, um, I've had an interesting uh, journey, and I told him all about that at my first interview, and wondered if he would be scared off because I have looked for truth in a variety of places. And I think that fits in this with uh, St. Luke, so that I could actually mention this, because it's been the most uh, uh, secret thing that I've kept from different, different groups. I was raised very fundamentalist, um, and um, the Bible was kind of scary, and uh, I never felt God's love in that especially once I reached puberty. I knew that I was screwed by then. And, and so, um, and I felt that I had to run away from that. It was scary because I loved the music in it, and it was the place that I learned music the best. It was the best training ground ever, is to play for one of those churches where they sang like you wouldn't believe. And, uh, and uh, just so some of the paths that I have been on, and I've called them rooms, I told Eric when he was here, I was a religious schizophrenic. And uh, I said, none of these agree. They've all killed each other in these different, but I can go into those places and find something. And, um, and so I have been, you know, read the Bible through by the time I was eight, 
uh, studied, you know, enormous amount, altar calls, um, camp meetings, and that sort of thing was my, my youngest. And then when my oldest child was born, I ended up in the Russian Orthodox Church that I was very serious about. If you see my library, and I've offered my library to the pastors here, and I said, I've got about 100 books on each of these things. And I learned so much about the Eastern Church that the Western Church really didn't know in all of its forms, from Protestant to Catholic, because they were so influenced by Augustine, which the Eastern Church was not. And they were all one until 1052. And, um, and all of these things that I've been into, and just was, oh, I was going to be a priest in the Orthodox Church, and so on and so forth, and all of these that I've entered that I thought was the final answer, and I told everybody was, then I, I've had to leave. I've had to leave every one of them. And, I, and that was not by choice. Uh, it was not something I was planning to do, but it felt like it was just not complete. And, um, and so some of the things that I've been into, uh, Buddhism very, very deeply. Um, when I joined the Buddhist uh, temple, the, the founder was amazing. He, he believed in, uh, he wrote a wonderful book called uh, Perfectly Willing. When he was told he might not be able to walk again, he saw nothing but good in that. Oh, now I'll have time. He said he might go blind. Okay, now I'll have time to meditate. He just constantly, and he wanted his own copy of the sutras when he was little, so it, and they wouldn't give him a copy or a pen, so he would cut his fingers to get blood to put into an inkwell so he could write out the scriptures uh, for his own copy. I mean, that shows really, you know, a dedication. And <clears throat> um, the philosophy of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, um, uh, Christian science, which has been a huge influence on my life. The uh, atheist uh, Ayn Rand and her philosophy is one of the best places that I found out true spirituality about music. Uh, and I thought, none of these, these all look different and whatever, but I can go into those rooms. I know how to act in, their, in, in each situation. And, and I have benefited. And at my funeral, I want some of the good from all of those to be represented. Uh, because it's a part of me, and I jump around, and right before my surgery, somehow they got integrated in my head. And it's like I saw kind of how they're all integrated, and they're all saying the same thing from a different perspective. Was that? Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Have you mi you've ministered through music almost the entirety of your life, since you were eight when you started at your father's church except for kind of a brief 14-year period where you were in a small town in the Sierra Nevadas. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your philosophy of music. Yes. Uh, music has been the consistent thing in my life from a young child. I can remember my earliest remember, memory playing on the uh, table, pretending I was playing, and then getting a toy play piano and just hitting it and just thought it was the most wonderful sound I'd ever heard. And, um, and just something that, you know, that was deeper and safe. It was always uh, the safest place in my life and always has been. And somehow that it takes you further. And I said, this is where Ayn Rand helped me recently and some of the stuff about in philosophy, the role of aesthetics and, and beauty. I mean, look at this building. Um, there's two buildings in town that I think are the most spiritual and they're based on beauty. They're not barns, they're not just plain, they're, you know, they're extravagant. This building is extravagant. And this one in the Greek Orthodox Church, I think, are the two warmest, uh, beautiful, and when you enter here, something happens to you that's beyond words. And, and, and it happened every time I would come in and practice and look at the windows and the whatever, and this never would have probably been built if Mrs. Prendergast's 10-year-old child hadn't died, and then she had this built at really no, no expense spared, and we've all benefited over the centuries that this is here. And we could have just built a barn and, and had service, but we have this magnificent beauty, and that's where the arts are. To me, the words are pointing to the truth, and we need them. We need the Bible. We need 
uh, writings, we need sermons, whatever, but they're pointing and the music and the art and the beauty take you in. Um, Luke can stand up here and tell me how wonderful an ice cream cone is, but when you have music, you taste it. And now you know, and you don't have to talk about it. You don't have to whatever, because we might talk about, and all of us come from so many traditions in this church, and uh, you're all welcome, and we all fit. But if we started arguing about theology, we might start fighting and have factions. But somehow all are welcome here because we get beyond that. When you sing Amazing Grace, as, as um, our musicians, so bad with names anymore, um, Cindy and, 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 and Kirsty play, played that this morning, it's like the words just are given wings and it's just like you have entered into perfection. It is perfection on earth. It is incarnate. Ayn Rand said, the music and the great art is perfection on this plane. And I said, that's incarnational words. The word was made flesh. Um, the first prayer, the first petition in the Lord's prayer is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here. Not die and go to heaven. Make it incarnate. The idea of God becoming incarnate means it's here, it's here. There's no other place to, that we have to go to try to get it better. It's to make it here. And the music to me always has, I see Bach and Beethoven and I see the perfection of how they were conceived and how is this even possible in humanity and to give the opportunity to play those that to me take you inside the room. All the religions, all the different philosophies are doors to the room, they're pointing to it but there's more. Don't make an idol of it. Don't make an idol of the stories. Don't make it, let it take you into that perfection where you do reside. My favorite line from the Gospel of Thomas, you know there were a lot of Gospels that were loved by early church before the, the final creed was of the New Testament was completed. And Gospel of Thomas was one of them and there's a marvelous uh, statement near the end that says, the kingdom of God is spread upon the earth, but they don't see it. And I just think that is just, you know, it's incarnate. It's what we do every Sunday. Um, I, I, he hasn't, he, he, was, he told me he would go, <coughs> when, when I need to, <laughs> there he goes, okay. <laughs> so our texts today are all about resurrection. And I wonder, Ron, how has music helped you experience or find the resurrection? Well, it's, in, it's interesting, you know, in a, in a way, this past year, uh, you know, if you look at it from one angle, you know, on the third anniversary of my son's death from this very same thing, I was told I had the same thing. Now, it's like, how can it get worse than this? You know, and I was just kind of numb about it, and what do I make sense of it? And that you're basically given a year. Well, I've gone 10 months, and and what does that mean? And I know what my uh, caregivers uh, think, and uh, it is somewhat short, but it, was, it gave me uh, a really a, a wonderful gift. I've never lived so much, so more richly, more deeply. Um, one of my prayers early on was, please God make me well so I can go back to complain about stupid stuff, <laughs> and, which is what we tend to do. We complain about life all the time. Things are just not, people aren't acting right, which they probably aren't, including me. And, and um, are we living it? Are we actually living it? The abundant life. And, and it's, it's so full in the New Testament. When you look at it this way, there's so much about stuff. We're waiting for Jesus to come. Well, maybe he's already here. And you're just waiting for us to see it. And, and um, see, the question was, Oh, the, uh, this reading, the dry bones. And, and I said, okay, I'm dying from this cancer. There is no cure for this. Um, we can try to extend it. I will eventually die. Every single person since Jesus has died, I think. Uh, I think some religions think different people did not die. But, um, and it was like, well, Jesus rose from the dead. None of us has. Well, great for him. You know, sucks for us, but, you know. But, but maybe this is, 
it's just a transfer. Um, if I hadn't gotten this, we couldn't have had Cindy here and Christy here this morning. And I just did just their beautiful prelude. And thank you so much, Cindy, for, for filling in and for coming in here and bringing all of your magnificent talents. See, I'm trying to get her back into, into church full time. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's my, you know, and I understand her situation, but, and it's how hard it will be for her when, when she t turns the mantle over to somebody else. But how beautiful to come in here and hear that prelude this morning on Amazing Grace and that marvelous P.A. Yesu and, and, uh, and to sit out here. And I said, this couldn't happen if this hadn't happened to me. If I couldn't step down, somebody else couldn't have stepped up to bring their stuff. We are constantly moving. If somebody graduates, they leave home. That's a death. It's a good one, isn't it? And it hurts a little bit, but it's wonderful. It should hurt a little bit. Uh, when, you, when you love and, and you are loved and you have to leave, it, it should hurt a little bit, but it's a good hurt. It's not a destructive hurt. It's because it was worth it. And so every morning I wake up and said, I'm still here. How am I going to spend today? Um, and I am hampered. I can't do what I did. And, uh, uh, and so with, there is a resurrection of, 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 you know, however it looks. I don't understand. I don't understand what happens when we die after I just study it. Can there be consciousness without matter? I don't know. Uh, and I kind of like, but can you just trust and say, you're moving on and you've gone beyond the shore in your boat and you can't see where it's going. Uh, do I have to continue? It's like the universe is working perfectly. We have 3.8 million cells that read their DNA code every day, every second. Every second, 3.8 million cells are read and copied perfectly in our bodies for us to be alive, and other ones die, and the first ones have to die. So what is music, especially, to be the highest of the arts? And I don't care if it's considered religious or secular. If it's good, it's holy. It's perfect. And Rachmaninoff's Zaki Concerto, which is a secular piece, it's one of the most holy pieces ever. Uh, the tune to Amazing Grace, whether we had the words or not, is just incredible. And in every single one of those don't exist. They're only a code that we can recreate. My job is to recreate them each time in a matter of time versus the stained glass versus a, a statue. The music doesn't exist outside the code. Now I can read the code and hear the music in my head, but that took years and years of training to do, and a lot of people can't do that. I'm very grateful that I can, and but we have to make it alive, um, and then it goes away, and every chord has to play and be beautiful, and then die for the next chord to play. That's death. That's It's a perfect system, and sure, we don't like it. I haven't liked it, but in the same way, it's, it's probably the, exactly the right thing. We've got to step down and hand the mantle to somebody else. And music is the perfect reflection of that. And when I played the music, and especially the music of Franck this past year, it has sustained me so much. My brain works better after I played it. And, and I'm whole and complete, and everything is right. Even though there's no words attached to it, it's just, it's, it, it, it is perfection. And it, it raises me to wholeness uh, to, uh, to, do, to do that. And I take it very, very seriously. Um, it is a ministry. It reaches out. When I hear people will say, your ministry is important, it meant something to me uh, a lot. And sometimes the words. I heard a person say to me in this church, and I thought so much about it because she was so badly hurt in Christianity. She said, I can't say the Psalms, but I can sing them. And I said, I know exactly what you mean, because those words were used to hurt. But the music and the poetry throughout history, and I'm studying music from the third and fifth century, and there's just beautiful, beautiful, loving music of just, that just lifts your soul. And, and, and music unites. I said, the words can cause the Tower of Babel, where 
nobody could understand each other and they fought and hurt each other. To me, music brings you to Pentecost where everyone heard in their own language what they needed to hear. And everybody here has a past, kind of like me, the whole church together has from all sorts of, of backgrounds and understandings, but you're all welcome here and you're all welcome at, the, at, at communion because you, because you are here. And, and uh, uh, did I go into the last question? <laughs> you did, we're good, we're good, don't worry. Uh, are we okay? <laughs> we're good. Um, uh, and so oh, you, you, the question was resurrection. Where's the hope, yeah. So I said, I went home and after we read it last night and I picked up my son's ashes and looked at him and these bones will come, you know, and, um, and then today it's just the opposite of what it seems like reality is showing us. And one of the things I did learn from Christian science a lot of times is uh, there is a higher uh, knowledge than what you're actually seeing. And, um, and I gained so much uh, from that. And, uh, and, um, and kind of, I think, uh, an acceptance. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing that needs to be prayed for. Everything's under control. We're in the kingdom right now. This is the greatest moment that's ever existed. And this is how I've tried to live the last 10 months is this is just wonderful. Could it be any better than this? And when I thought about going into that room, what's in the room of reality? I call it ultimate reality. To me, ultimate total reality, uh, the notion God has negative limited meaning for me. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. It's just a limited, you know, and God is kind of like what we think humans are versus there's a total ultimate reality and what is that and I'm out of that and I don't know what it all is but I'm not being held to that standard Jesus never preached doctrine and and so the um, uh, and our church and the uniqueness oh I'm going into the last question is St. Luke's before I went under the knife uh, after two days before I had been in New York to pick out the world's greatest piano thanks to Tim and uh, and I'm probably drugged to the max and whatever, and before I go under, all of a sudden I saw the rooms and I saw the doors and saw that there was no conflict. And I saw St. Luke's as this unifying Pentecost. You know, Jesus said if he didn't go away, the spirit couldn't come where you will receive power. And so that was a death. Jesus leaving, and he says, I'll be back, and like a good contractor, he waited 2,000 years, and, uh, and I said, but maybe he did, maybe he's all come back, and then we can see it when we're ready, and so it says, go into the room, and all of you, when you go into the room, think about what's in that room of ultimate reality, of heaven, whatever you want to call it, and to me, I'll only give you a hint, turn the light on, if the lights, you can be right here, and seeing stuff, but you're blind and you don't see because the lights aren't lights aren't on. Yes, the lights are on, but are you really seeing that we're in the midst of incredible magic, incredible, that the idea of us all being here would have taken trillions and trillions of chances. I, uh, uh, I mean, the, the chances that we are united here right now is unbelievable of how this could happen. And there's nothing missing. We keep thinking, well, tomorrow it'll be there, or it'll be better here, or it'll be better there, and whatever. And it's all right here. I'm in the, I'm, I'm here for a purpose. If I hadn't left California, and they cried when I left, I would never have retired early and never came, come here. I wouldn't have retired early if I hadn't adopted my youngest son, who's here. Uh, JT and I didn't know how I was going to raise him by myself and the judge said how are you going to do this I said I don't know but I have to do it and I want to do it more than anything and I retired early and I we came here and so I got to be here and and when my time is up my time is up it's not my God kind of told me it's not my business 
um, it's, you know, just, just do what you're doing. It's all right. It's all right. Just trust a little bit. You don't tell your kids every little thing. And so, you know, when it's time to go, it's time to go. And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I don't always believe that, but, but, but I, I want to, and it's just and so grateful to be here and to have spent the years that I have and the people that I have done and the music I've got to play and the instruments that I've got to play that I have to say goodbye to. I sold my piano at home, which is my second favorite piano in the world, and it's like you have to give everything up. All the stuff that you're hanging on to, you're going to give up someday. It's easier to give it up and you're just like, let it go, and where's it going, and it's going to help. My piano's going to help um, Chautauqua, and uh, it's just, yes, it'll hurt, but look at what it's going to do, mm -hmm. and which it's not doing now. And if I hadn't left, Cindy wouldn't have come, and Cindy needed to come, and, and, uh, and all the, the, the strength that she brings and every, you know, at some point, Luca leave. He made, he, he promised me he would never leave, and I'm making sure that happens. <laughs> so, because uh, obviously he said he, he has to do my funeral. And, and uh, so, uh, I think I've said it all. Yes, you have. <laughs> Speaking of time to go. Um, <laughs> Thank Ron you, thank a, you, thank you, Luke, for everything. Thank you, Ron. Ron's been a gift to us in so many ways. Not.